Hello, and welcome to the Dark Ages podcast. Today's episode, The Magical History Tour. This episode is a kind of digest, a summary of events and changes all around Europe, aiming to have a more or less comprehensive picture of the situation around the time of Theodoric's death in 526. In terms of listening time, it's relatively short, but that just makes it more densely packed with information. So make sure that you take really good notes, as there will be a test next week, and if you don't pass that test, then you're not allowed to listen to the show anymore. Kidding, of course. You don't have to pass any test, and you need to keep listening, please. Really. On it. Seriously, keep listening. And really, don't worry too much about the names. The general picture is more important than as a starting point. We'll be entering a new phase going forward from here. By the end of this episode, 50 years will have passed since Romulus Augustus was deposed, and the living memory of the Western Empire was fading. How people thought about it was changing, both in the East and the West, and the nature of its legacy would be decided in the coming decades. That's for later, though. Today's show will start where we left off last time, with the sons of Clovis and Francia. We'll talk about Burgundy, and then the Visigoths and Suevi in Spain, and you forgot about the Suevi, didn't you? It's okay, everybody does. In a perfectly logical move, then we'll hop over to the lands beyond the old frontiers, to Germany and the Danube Basin, and a quick check-in with Constantinople will bring us up to date with what's been happening over there. And then for reasons that I hope will eventually become clear, we will finish up in Africa. I hope all of your passports are up to date, it's a lot of ground to cover, and you're all going to need a new Eurail pass, and there's no point in dilly-dallying, so let's get going and get the best possible start for a trip by heading to Paris to check in with the Sons of Clovis. Gregory doesn't have much to say about the Three Sons of Clovis by Clotilde during the first decade after his death. Only their half-brother Theuderic attracts his attention, as he is forced to fight off an invasion from a people we haven't heard from up until this point, the Danes. Actually, we did hear about them in the Nibelogen lead. This invasion was led by a king Gregory names as Klochelich. It's generally agreed that this is a Frankish translation of the name of a Danish king named Higlak. Now, if you're an English lit major, and that's rigging some pattern neurons, then that would be because Higlak is Beowulf's uncle, the king of the Geats, in that one poem. You know the one. I can't think of the name right now. Fun fact, Higlak was killed in the course of this raid, estimated to take, have taken place around 516, and his body was left on the field due to the disorganized retreat of the Danes. He was found by the Franks, and because of his incredible height, his corpse was displayed as a curiosity in Theuderic's court for many years afterwards. Theuderic's other big exploit was the complete annexation of the lands of the Thuringians. In an episode that is spookily similar to the Burgundian drama that Clovis was involved in, the Thuringians consistently serve as dupes for the Franks in Gregory's narrative, but they can't have been complete non-entities. Theodoric courted them to secure his northern frontiers, and though they lived outside the boundaries of the Roman Empire, it's possible that many of them were already Christians. Another significant section of their territory now fell under Frankish rule, and the reach of the, peop and the, reach of the Frankish Empire reached a little further beyond the old limes of the Romans. Theodoric's conquests were just a manifestation of the family business, as all four of Clovis's sons expanded their territories in whichever direction opportunity presented. Sometimes they teamed up in pairs or trios, sometimes in solo operations. There's a strong sense in the sources that their external wars were basically a way of sublimating their sibling rivalries and keeping civil war at bay. By dividing his realms as he did, Clovis put a centrifugal force in place that would be the Achilles' heel of the Merovingian realms for most of their existence. The death of Clovis, coming as it did after the humbling of the Visigoths, left space for the Burgundians to rise in the power rankings of Gaul. Their king Gundabad still officially held the Roman imperial title of Magister Militum, and when he died in 516, his son Sigismund successfully petitioned the emperor to inherit that title, along with the rank of patrician. 
Religious drama dominates the Burgundian court for the next few years, as Sigismund was an enthusiastic convert of Catholicism. He convened a council of the bishops in his lands to discuss how to dismantle the Arian church in Burgundy, but the honeymoon period for the new king was short. He fell out with his bishops, and his second wife manipulated him into murdering his own son. That's the story we're given anyway, which I mentioned earlier in one of the episodes about Theodoric. The upheaval proved a tempting opportunity for Clovis's son Clodomer, who attacked the Burgundians in 523 and quickly defeated the forces of Sigismund. Sigismund and most of his family were killed, but his bounty was retrieved and taken back to a monastery that he had founded at Agaon, where it became the focus of the very first cult of a royal saint. The Burgundians' cause wasn't dead yet, though, as Sigismund's brother Godemar appeared at the head of an army, part of which he had borrowed from Theodoric the Great. Our old friend Theodoric was well into his grumpy period by then and probably had had just about enough of the Frankish shenanigans on his doorstep. Godemar and his army met the Franks at Vezeros, about 30 miles east of Lyon. Clodomer was killed in the battle, and Godemar became the new king of the Burgundians, while owing a debt of honor to Theodoric, of course. A helmet was found near the battle site in the 19th century. It is a beautiful piece of Eastern Roman workmanship, probably belonging to a chieftain on one side or the other of the conflict, and it can currently be seen in the Musée Dauphinois in Grenoble. And obviously, I put a picture, or I will put a picture of that up on the website and on Instagram. Clodomer's story has its own tragic coda. His children lived with their grandmother Clotilde in Paris, until their uncles, Clothar and Kildebert, conspired to divide Clodomer's domain up between them. Now that would obviously and regrettably require the elimination of these inconvenient nephews. Two of Clodomer's three sons were murdered. The third, Clodoald, escaped and fled to Provence. He made a more permanent escape when he renounced all of his temporal titles and worldly wealth and became a hermit and preacher. He thus seemed to be no threat to his Frankish relatives, and he was able to return to Paris. Eventually, he found a nice hill for himself next to the Seine, downstream from Paris, where he retired to pray in solitude. He built a church there, and both it and the town that grew up around it were named after him. Today, it's known as saint Cloud, which listeners to Mike Duncan may remember as the site of one of the Bourbons' royal hunting lodges, and is now one of the wealthiest towns in France. Let us abandon the green fields of France and head down towards Spain. Not to the clear blue waters of the Mediterranean, nor to the baking interior. Our first stop will be the northwest corner, where mountain valleys and canned seafood proliferate. Way back when. Those of you with very big brains may remember that the Vandals, on their way to Africa, were accompanied by two other tribes, the Iranian Alans and the Germanic Suevi. The Alans accompanied the Vandals across the Straits, while the Suevi stayed in Spain and eventually carved out a kingdom for themselves in the northwest. They are still there, wedged up in the mountainous northwest of the Iberian Peninsula, with a kingdom centered on Braga in modern Portugal. I haven't mentioned them for the very simple reason that after about 470, almost nothing is known about their political history. They were diplomatically active in those years, maintaining relations with the Visigoths, Romans, and Burgundians, but they were simply too peripheral for the chroniclers of the time to take much notice. The kingdom's high point was around 455, when their influence stretched all the way down to Malaga. By the 510s, though, conflict with the Visigoths and a rebellion by local Roman elites had pushed them up into the territory of modern Galicia and northern Portugal. We don't even name, know the name of all of their kings from about 470 until about 550. Our primary source, Isidore of Seville, tells us only that there were a lot of them, and that they remained, like the Visigoths, Arians. We left the still proudly Arian Visigoths in disarray after their defeat at Vouil and the death of Alaric II. In the immediate aftermath of the battle, the most pressing issue was succession. Alaric had one young son by his wife, Theodogotha, the daughter of Theodoric the Great. This young Amalaric, for such was his name, was only about five years old when his father died. The Visigoths were reluctant to support such a young king at a time of crisis, so an alternative was found instead. Gesalic was also Alaric's son, though he was illegitimate. In his mid-twenties, he was at least credible as a leader of armies, and the Visigoths elected him as their new king. 
It wasn't what you would call a plum job at that point. Attempting to reorganize the Visigoths' kingdom in the face of massive territorial losses and continuing Frankish aggression. Gasalic hung in there for about three years, but in 510, Theodoric sent an army to invade in the name of young Amalaric, who was, after all, his grandson. Gasalic was forced to flee to Africa, but got very little help from the Vandal kings, who were in, in no position at the time to stand up to Theodoric. Gasalic scraped together a few men and made a last ditch attempt to return to the Visigothic throne but was repeat defeated again. He retreated to Burgundy, where he was murdered. Theodoric, as we know, declared himself regent for Amalaric. The territories were ruled by a prefect named Stephen, and it appears that he was able to retake some Gallic territory from the Franks, specifically in Gascony. In spite of how it appears on the maps, the Visigoths had not spent much time or effort pushing their influence into the Iberian Peninsula very deeply. There were certainly Gothic garrisons in some towns, but that's not the same as full administrative control of a region. The reality seems to have been a patchwork of semi-independent city-states, run on Roman models by the old Ibero-Roman elites. The tenuous control of the Visigoths is demonstrated by the entry for 494 in the Chronicle of Saragossa, which notes that in that year, the Goths entered Spain. Now, since the Visigoths have had some presence in Spain since 418, this seems like an odd thing to take note of, unless that presence has been particularly light, and only now did an influx of Gothic settlers appear and begin to increase their influence. The Chronicle records several tyrants who were overthrown and executed by the Goths. These were probably the local powers that were rivals to the Visigoths, gradually expanding their power in the region. Even after Vuil, the center of Visigothic gravity remained the coastal strip from Tarragona to Narbonne, with influence up the Ebro Valley and along the foothills of the Pyrenees. It's a reminder that the solid blocks of color that we're used to on a map are often a woeful oversimplification of political realities on the ground. In the absence of strong outside authority, the old landowners of southern Spain did their best to carry on governing themselves as they had before. Over time, Visigothic influence would grow, but tensions between the Aryan military elite and the Catholic civic elite would remain for the next four generations. Back up north, in a completely logical way, we're going to head to the far side of the Rhine, in what the Romans used to call Greater Germania, and what was now being absorbed by the Frankish kingdoms. The Thuringians and Alamanni, faced with the seemingly unstoppable onslaught of Frankish aggression, were forced to come to terms with new realities. As always, we have to remember that these are confederations of smaller tribes, and that the existence of a Thuringian king does not necessarily indicate a unified Thuringian people. So some of the Rhinelanders, a word that I just decided now to use for the two collectively, and also a town in northern Wisconsin, submitted to Frankish hegemony, while others, especially those up against the Alps, looked to Theodoric for support. Theodoric was happy to have them as a buffer against both the Franks and the hodgepodge of other Germanic tribes to the east. He promised support, and in return they would guard the mouths of the mountain passes that led into Italy. Beyond the Rhinelanders, the picture is just as confused as it has ever been. The Upper Danube Valleys and the future lands of Bohemia continued to be fought over by various Germanic barbarian groups, coalescing and forming new identities as conditions shifted. A new round of confederation seems to have been underway, and a new generation of tribal names are beginning to become visible in the region. The Herules and Rugai remain, if you remember them, but they've now been joined by Bavarians and Lombards. There are still a few Vandals running around too, those that opted not to migrate at the beginning of the 5th century. Further to the north, the Saxons seem to be growing in strength along with the Frisians, and further north still, the Angles and Danes. And maybe the Jutes, although where exactly the Jutes came from is a bit of a mystery for another time. These tribes are effectively the next generation of barbarians. They will repeat the cycle of putting pressure on the Germanic kingdom's borders, just as their forebearers had put pressure on the Romans. Down the beautiful Blue Danube, the Gepid kingdom occupied the majority of the future Hungarian plain. I don't have much to add to their story from what we've already heard, so just a quick refresher. The city of Sirmium was a bone of contention between the Gepid Kingdom and Theodoric the Great, who eventually retook it. Sirmium was the hinge on which the Danube frontier had once turned, and still guarded the approaches to Italy from the east and northeast. Even without the former Roman capital, the Gepid Kingdom was strong enough to offer protection to the Herald tribes, who were feeling the pressure from those newcomers, especially the Lombards. 
The Gepids also enjoyed overall good relationships with Constantinople. Gepid soldiers served in the Eastern Army, trade was strong, and their kings grew rich. Further east still, over the Carpathians, were once again on the steppe. Out there, the swirling, bewildering array of horse peoples, out of which the Huns had once appeared, still remains. There were still Hun tribes out on the plains, and they were still willing to sell their services to any commander who might want them. Other tribes were there too, but none of them had yet reached a level of cohesion to be a threat to any of their neighbors, beyond the kind of border raiding that was just part of life for the settled people at the edge of the Great Grass Sea. That will change soon, though. One group to note, just for interest's sake, is the Goths of Crimea. Still there. Still Gothic. And a reminder that none of the migrations we've heard about, and will continue to hear about, were all-or-nothing affairs. The general eastward drift of our story in this episode should make the next destination of our tour clear. Constantinople. I remember saying a while back that I wasn't planning on spending much time on the details of what was going on over there, partly because I can only do so much, and it would just become all Constantinople all the time, and but mostly because Robin Pearson's History of Byzantium has it all covered admirably. I do feel the need, though, for those of you who have not listened to that excellent and now venerable podcast, to bring you up to date on the general outline of what has been happening in the remaining provinces of the Roman Empire. I had wondered how many episodes I would need to write before I started forgetting what I have and haven't told you. 36, it turns out. Looking back at my scripts, I see that I gave a pretty good accounting of how Anastasius had come to imperial power, but little about his actual reign. He was an old man in his 60s when he was past the diadem, and he had a reputation for being a bit of a cheap stick in the mud. Much of his military attention was focused eastward, on the Persians, and on revels in Isauria, which went a fair way to keeping him off of Theodoric's back. A Monophysite, he was out of step with much of the church, including the Pope, which probably also helped Theodoric by keeping the pontiff from feeling too compelled to fight in the emperor's corner. This was all part of the Acacian Schism, back from that episode titled Schism. If you can remember that far back, you may also remember that the emperor's death in 518 went a long way to resolving that schism. That was good for the unity of the church, bad for Theodoric's peace of mind. Anastasius left no heir, and palace intrigue and a pretty impressive bit of chicanery led to the elevation of Justin, the commander of the palace guard. Justin was impeccably orthodox in his faith, and he was quickly on good terms with the Pope and the Roman Senate. You remember that it was a letter to the emperor that had indirectly led to the execution of Boethius? Justin was the emperor. The emperor kept up warm relations with the Frankish kings as well, and with the Burgundians, and it all made the Ostrogothic king very nervous. Justin had been a career soldier in the east, but by birth he was a Latin-speaking peasant from Illyricum. As local boy made good as he climbed the ranks, Justin made sure that his family benefited from his success. He brought many of them to live in the capital and found them all jobs. He was especially impressed by one of those relations in particular, his nephew, Petrus Sabatius. He adopted the boy and made sure that he got a first-rate education and all the career help he could get. As was a Roman tradition, Sabatius added a name to honor his benefactor, the name we know him by, Justinianus. When the ultimate elevation came Justin's way, Justinian was made an officer in the palace guard and spent most of Justin's reign at his uncle's shoulder, clearly being groomed for even higher office. Justin would die just a year after Theodoric, and Justinian succeeded him, and that would have truly momentous consequences for the barbarian kingdoms. All that remains to catch up on, then, is Africa. And I'm actually going to hold off on describing much about the development of the Vandal Kingdom, because that's where I plan on picking up when I get back. However, somebody in a review asked for more information about the situation in Mauritania, the lands to the west of the province of Africa, and here seems like a good place for it. Before the Vandals arrived, the north coast of Africa was divided between the coastal towns, surrounded and sustained by arable farmland, and the hills and mountains to the south, which divided the coast from the desert. 
The further inland you went, the less settled the lifestyle became. Farmers gave way to shepherds and goat herders who moved back and forth between winter and summer grazing territories, who then in turn gave way to fully nomadic tribes of the desert who lived by trading and raiding. Ethnically, the Berber-speaking people of the region were, in general, described as Mori, from which derive the names of the two provinces, Moria Tingitata and Moria Caesariensis, and the English word Mor, as in Othello. Mori cavalry served regularly in the late Roman field armies, and St. Augustine was ethnically Mori. The histories I read usually just call them Moorish, and I will probably use Mori and Moorish interchangeably as we go along. Not all Mori were Roman subjects. Most of the nomads and semi-nomads of the interior were also Berber speakers and the ancestors of the modern Tuareg peoples. And that right there is a rabbit hole into which I peered and then quickly retreated, lest we be here all day. During the height of the Pax Romana, form frontier fortresses were maintained along the edge of the desert, and raiding was kept to a minimum through careful management of trade and tribute. The nomad kings, like frontier kings everywhere in the, around the empire, were eager for the recognition of the Roman state. Just as elsewhere, it increased a leader's prestige and legitimacy to be the one to whom Rome came when they needed something. All the same, the southern frontier was never as clearly delimited as it was in the north or east where there were walls and rivers. How far the empire extended really depended on how far the fortress garrisons were prepared to venture on their patrols. As the empire entered crisis, that began to change. As western resources were more and more tied up in the defense of the northern frontiers, imperial authority became less and less evident in Mauritania. There was only one field army stationed in the region, and that was based in Africa, a long way from Morocco. It's hard to say exactly when Mauritania was lost to Roman control entirely, or even what that might mean in practice. Was it when Ravenna stopped collecting taxes? Or when Ravenna stopped answering letters? The city of Volubilis in Morocco fell to local tribes as early as 285, and was never retaken. Certainly once the Vandals arrived, the whole of the Maghreb was beyond Roman influence, and it would remain that way. But the Vandals didn't stay. They pushed on to take Carthage and the richest farmlands of Africa proper, as we know. There simply weren't enough of them to contemplate holding such a lengthy strip of land, so they consolidated their holdings around the richest parts of modern Tunisia and left the western provinces to do the best they could. What that meant in practice is very difficult to discover. There are no written sources that deal directly with the region in the period. We had to tease what we can out of other writings, especially Procopius's history of the wars of Justinian. Archaeologically, we see changes that we've seen elsewhere. Town forums shrinking, being impinged upon by residents of the wealthy as public life becomes less and less important. Public baths held on longer in Mauritania than elsewhere in the old empire, it seems, with some towns maintaining and even rebuilding their bathhouses into the middle of the 7th century. That's not too surprising, I suppose. It's hot down there. There is another explanation, too. Bathing is often seen as central to Roman culture. Christianity, uncomfortable as it is with nudity, had begun to make a dent in its importance but its survival in the African provinces can be interpreted as a survival of Roman identity there. The political situation, as near as we can make out, seems to fit with that interpretation. The Roman towns became centers for new kingdoms, with native Mori leaders, setting up a situation much like those in Italy and Africa, a barbarian army supported by Roman tax collectors. We don't know how these kingdoms came to be created, how they interacted with each other, and we're even unsure of how big they were and how many of them there were. Our only evidence for them is inscriptions, which are by their nature only brief snippets. Some of these leaders may have been from among the nomads, but some of them may have been former imperial officials of one kind or another. One, named Mastes, declared in an inscription that he had been Dux of the Moors for 67 years and Imperator of the Moors and Romans for 10 Imperator, of course, means emperor. He proclaimed himself a Catholic Christian around 476, possibly as part of a rebellion against the Vandals. Masti's empire, if that's what we're going to call it, was centered on Eris in modern Algeria and may not have extended much beyond its own river valley. Another kingdom, at Altava, further to the west, 
is known through an inscription dedicated to one Masuna, referred to as Rex Gentium Maurorum and Romanorum, king of the Moorish and Roman people. That same inscription lists officials of Masuna's reign, all of them with Moorish names and Roman job titles. It's the same story for other Berber kingdoms, uncertainty, other than the continuation of a Roman identity welded to an increasingly prominent Berber one. Some of these polities would be absorbed later on in the 6th century by Byzantine expansion, while others would maintain their independence until the arrival of the Muslims. But, alas, the traces they left are not enough for us to reconstruct their whole story. I will be putting up a map of the important towns and sites of the region on the website and on Instagram. That would be www.darkagespod.com and at Dark Ages Pod for the gram. There is a Facebook group as well, but I once again confess I am completely stumped about what exactly to do with it. Liking the page will let you know when episodes drop, at least. Searching for Dark Ages Podcast should get you there. As I mentioned last time, there will be a gap after this episode, as I and the Dark Ages family are taking off for a long road trip. On the day this drops, I should be immersed in some very different history, as I will be touring Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson. I have some ideas that I hope to put in place before I get back, which will, with luck, make me a little more consistent with the release dates, and also make the show easier to navigate. It won't affect the content in any meaningful way, though. I'll tell you more once I've got it all worked out. A good 75% of you listen to the show on Spotify, and if you haven't noticed, Spotify has recently enabled a QA and a feature, where you can respond to individual episodes. The default question is, what did you think of this episode? and I am genuinely interested to hear your opinions on the show. You can also rate and review it on Apple Podcasts, of course, and a number of other podcatchers, like Podcast Addict, where listener Barchester left a very nice review just the other day. I also enjoy getting notifications from ko-fi.com, ko-fi.com, whenever someone has supported the show. Your contributions help defray the cost of hosting, promotion, and sometimes quite expensive books. Academic publishing is a racket. On that subject, thanks to Barney for his generous donation, and to Paul, Scott, Jesse, Ellen, and Brendan, all of whom contribute monthly and are the proud recipients of my deepest gratitude. When I come back, I will be bringing you the tale of how the Eastern Empire tried to bring back what had been lost. There will be war, glory, vainglory, and tragedy. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thank you for listening, and take care.